want to do is focus on two guys that were also very faithful, but their focus was different. They lived at a really different time in the history of, of their culture, uh, and they had to deal with uh, the government, and they had to deal with a lot of um, how, do, how do I talk to my government? And God's raising these men up. Um, and you'll see two different approaches between Ambrose and John Christosom, uh, Christostom um, that uh, are going to contrast and they're going to kind of be indicative of how the church interacts with uh, their, their uh, state moving forward. So um, we are now at the close of the 4th century, so the end of the 300s, early 400s, and, and that's when these guys lived. Now, what was, spe what was special about that time, as far as we're concerned? What was happening at the end of the 300s? Something fairly significant. Like the fall of Rome, right? Mm -hmm. So they're about to have their world kind of blown up. Now, we're looking at it, of course, through history. We're looking at it and saying, here's what happened after it. Didn't you guys see the Visigoths moving south through this area? Didn't you see what was happening in North Africa? Did, of course they didn't, right? Number one, they didn't really have a huge scope like we do. Second, they didn't have hundreds of years of history to analyze what really happened and how it all worked and everything else, right? So all they knew was there was barbarians on the border, and those guys were getting more and more impressive in the way that they attacked because they were starting to uh, be, instead of isolated little tribes, they were starting to band together. And they became people like the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the, the Picts and the Scots and the um, Huns, Attila the Hun. All those guys were about this time period, and they were fighting against the Roman Empire from different directions, the Persians and so on. Okay, So all those names in history, for me, I've heard them all. I just never knew what they were about. Um, the other ones that come up at this time are the Vikings. The Vikings actually came all the way south. They were actually in the Mediterranean at one point. So all these guys are just, they're coming together. And as they come through, they're just slowly chipping away at the Roman Empire. And finally, in the 400s is when it all just falls apart, Okay, at least in the West. And it was during that time that these guys, Ambrose and John Christosom, were the guys that were ministering in the church at the time. Okay, so that's what we want to understand is what does that mean for them? How do they deal with that? Okay, so let's look at uh, Ambrose first. Um, he was born uh, between 337 and 340, somewhere uh, in the town of Trier in modern-day uh, Germany. Uh, according to legend, as he, was a, as he was a baby, a swarm of bees descended upon his face leaving behind only a drop of honey on his lips. That's why if you look at him after he's venerated now, all the pictures of him in the Catholic Church show him with like a beehive or something in the background. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Ambrose uh, became, studied uh, law, rhetoric. Uh, he became a governor uh, in the northwest, in what's around Milan, today's Milan. Um, he was actually pretty good at it, and that's what he was interested in. He wasn't interested in, in uh, the church, to be honest with you. In fact, he was never actually even baptized. He just... Um, he was a catechumen. He went through the teaching, but he, he, his, his ambition was to govern, and he was actually pretty good at it. He was, he was efficient. He was, he was uh, just. He was equal. Everyone trusted him. Well, that's a big deal when you're a governor, right? Um, uh, the Arian party still holds significant sway at the time. Um, this is now we've, we've passed over. Constantine has um, now in power. The church is a big deal. Um, the Arians were gone, now they're coming back at this time. So there's still this kind of this back and forth between the Arians and the Nicenes um, at the time of the Ambrose were, that we're looking at here. By this time, they've taken the name Arians and Catholics. Uh, not the Catholic that we know about, Catholics is the Nicenes, the universal. That was the Nicene Creed was what the universal church stood for. So they were the Catholics, um, whereas the Arians were the Arians, of course. Um, so at the time, Milan needed a new bishop. Um, they were going to vote for it. Both the Arians and the Catholics were trying to put forth their guys. Um, sounds a little bit familiar. Um, Ambrose was the governor of Milan. So he, when he looked at it, he, could really, he couldn't really care less about who actually was right. He was not overly concerned with whether the Arian position or the Catholic position was correct. What he did know is, I don't want to riot in my city. So he went to the election when they were debating, and he stood up and he calmed the crowd. And legend has it that a kid called out, just 
that's anecdotal. Somebody called out and said, well, maybe, maybe Ambrose ought to be the bishop. Okay? So as you can see, remember, this guy has no training. He's the governor. He has, he's not even baptized, and yet somebody says maybe he should be bishop. So that kind of tells you what they thought of the bishops. Okay? They're no longer elevated positions of teaching. They're just governing positions. So they said maybe Ambrose should be um, bishop. Uh, he didn't want it, but um, he didn't have a choice. Uh, let's see, he didn't seek the position. Um, he, he actually tried to flee the city to avoid it. Um, they came back and they found him. They got him back. Uh, Emperor Valentian I, um, who was ruling over the western half of the empire, said, mm, I think that's a good idea for you too, Ambrose. And so Ambrose finally gave in in 373. Um, now, remember, he wasn't uh, baptized, uh, nor was he a priest, so they finished all that in eight days. Oh. <laughs> okay. Because apparently it wasn't just that. You had to be, a, first you had to be baptized, of course. Then you had to become a priest. But then you're only like a priest of a first level. And then you had to rise up through the ranks before you were really ready to be a bishop. They finished all of that in eight days. Okay. So the good news is this guy was, he was kind of like we took it last, last week uh, with Athanasius. He didn't really want it, but once he was in it, he's in it, right? And so he gave his whole heart to it. Once he realized where God was calling him, once he realized what he was called to do, he just poured himself into the job. This is a great lesson for a lot of these guys. They didn't necessarily seek these positions out, which is probably why they were so good at them. Um, but once they were there, they realized what God had called them to do. And they just took all their gifts and they just poured it right into the position that God had put them. They made the most of where God had put them. And that right there is just a lesson for all of us, right? Stop whining about what you aren't. Stop whining about what you can't do or what you really wanted to do. And just start doing what you are, where you are. Start, start what is it? Um, start growing where you're planted, right? Stop worrying about better pastures. Um, anyway, so he took his role very seriously. Um, he took all that rhetoric and all the lawyer skills he had, and he starts applying it to the scriptures. Um, he gave himself to an ascetic lifestyle based kind of around the monks. Uh, he sold his possessions, and then he would feed the poor, right? Um, he never married. That was that will be a bigger deal a little bit later on. Um, uh, remember, we said he's a catechumen, so he didn't have any real previous theology, so he looked for someone to teach him. He found a guy from Rome. Well, why was that a big deal? Because what were the Romans teaching? The Bishop of Rome, remember, remember last week? We talked about Athanasius, and he was exiled. They threw him out. And they threw him out to Rome. And while he was in Rome, remember Athanasius was a Catholic. He was a Nicene guy. And then he starts talking to the Bishop of Rome. And what did he convince him? Nicene position. And so now Rome's heavily into the Nicene Creed. Right? And now Ambrose finds a teacher from Rome. So where does that place him on the spectrum? So he starts teaching. That's the scriptures that he's taught that Jesus is God and he is a separate person of Christ, uh, of the Godhead, mm -hmm. that he is, you know, and they're going through the whole uh, Nicene Creed as well as the um, anathemas against the Arians. So you can kind of see where Ambrose is probably going to land on this. Um, he was educated, so he read the um, Hebrew Old Testament and the works of Philo, and Origen, and, and Athanas Athanasius, as we just said, and Basil of Caesarea. Um, and he just, he became heavily nice seen in his view. Um, he also had a very uh, special place for the poor. So he would preach many messages charging Christians to give up their own, uh, their own riches, their own help to help the poor. Um, <clears throat> he viewed the role of pastor, and this is a big deal, he viewed the role of a pastor as one that must stand for the weak in the face of the strong. Okay? Now, that seems kind of interesting. Now, the scriptures are pretty clear. This is true religion to help the widows and the orphans. There was a message. Uh, Jesus said things like, uh, as, as much as you help one of these, one of these poor, you've helped me. Right? When you clothe them, you clothe me. That, that whole passage, that whole parable metaphor I don't know what that is. Um, the, the point that he was making um, was this is really true religion. It's to give of yourself to help those that need your help. That's what being a neighbor is, right? The Good Samaritan. Um, while that's biblical, 
where Ambrose started was, that's my role. I've got to protect the poor. I have to be the person that is uh, over the needy, that takes their cause and that runs them down. Okay. Ambrose was a big deal in the West. What does the Pope do today? Think about our, our current Pope. What does he tend to do? The guy's all over the place. Yeah, and where does he like to go? Mm -hmm. And talk about how we need the rich countries need to provide for the poor countries and everything else. So Ambrose was really one of the prototypes of that. What he does just keeps going on. Now, why would he do that? That's the question. Why was he so specific on that issue? That's the that's a harder question. Because nobody ever picks these things up from out of nowhere, right? There's usually some kind of cultural impetus, right? Nobody before really spoke about homosexuality the way our generation has to speak about homosexuality. It's, it wasn't an issue. Now it is. Much more on a forefront than it ever was before, so we had to deal with it. So where was Ambrose? Well, the monks were, were into an ascetic lifestyle, but the idea of caring for the poor, the monks lived by themselves. There was no poor. They didn't have anything. I guess they were all poor. Um, so that was a little bit different. Where did Father John live when he was in greater poverty? There was a lot of poverty, and there was a lot of looting, and, there was, and the empire wasn't strong. So what's your, where's the trade? And so you're going to find, soon, when the empire falls, it, Europe goes backwards. They become a series of small little states where primarily agricultural, there isn't trade, there isn't a share of information, there isn't a share of ideas. All that trade between East and West just gets cut off. The, the Western Europe becomes the backwater. I mean, it really is pretty <coughs> unimpressive for the next thousand years before we really start to see some glimmer of light. And then from there, it becomes like a cascade into the Renaissance and into a lot of other things where now they go off the other side of things, right? So <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot coming up. Ambrose was a prototype of the idea that things are falling apart, people's lives aren't as simple as they used to be. My job is to step in and to protect the people and to be the voice of the poor and to help the needy, right? And you're going to see this pattern flowing in from here to a guy named Gregory will become the... Um, the Bishop of Rome um, during the fall of Rome, and, and a lot of other guys over the next few generations, that's going to be their cause. And then what happens is once they stop being their cause, that's the call is, no, you're the bishop. You should be fighting for the poor and the needy. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to debate whether that's correct. Is that the role of a bishop or, a, or a, an elder? Is that the role of a Christian? Is it part of the role of a Christian as opposed to the only role? Okay, that's a different thing. Um, as a point, in, uh, as an example of this, uh, a party of Goths, um, Goths, because uh, I, I got caught up reading about this, um, Goths tend to come from actually southern Sweden. Um, they've, there's a lot of, you know, archaeology and things are trying to figure out where it all comes from. Uh, there, there appears to be an island that was once referred to as uh, Gotland, um, and just off of the southern coast of Sweden. And I think that's where we get the, our goth, uh, the actual goth tribe. Um, as they move south, they actually start to splinter into different, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, and some other ones that I don't remember. But that's where it all came from. It's actually kind of interesting. Then I had to stop reading. Um, anyway, so they start invading northern Italy. Um, many refugees fled to Milan. There's the poor. They have no... Nothing anymore. They're, they've, their, their land has been taken or burned or destroyed or whatever. Their livelihoods taken away. Um, Ambrose takes some of the gold and ornate vessels from the church, pays off the Goths to leave them alone, um, gets back the, the uh, hostages, um, and keeps the people. So people said, what are you doing? You're selling gold from the church. You're taking holy relics from the church, and you're just giving them to these barbarians? Many of which were actually Aryans, interesting enough. Um, 
So his response was, it is better to preserve the Lord's souls, better to preserve for the Lord souls rather than gold. He who sent the apostles without gold also gathered the churches without gold. The church has gold not to store it, but to give it up and use it for those who are in need. It is better to keep the living vessels than the golden ones. Okay, That was actually in a letter to other uh, priests. This is how you should act. Okay. Um, this guy is going to be responsible for the education of Augustine, which if Augustine of Hippo, mm-hmm. kind of a big deal. Yeah. Uh, he also has some interesting ideas on, the, on Mary. So Mary is starting to get venerated. So he starts to explain the fact that Mary was, uh, Mary was to Jesus what the temple was to worship, right? Mm-hmm. Where uh, Jesus is a special one. Right, God was a special one. The temple is impressive. The temple is important. The temple is interesting. But you don't worship the temple. You worship the God in the temple. So just like that, he says Jesus was the one who's worthy of worship. Mary was special, but she's just like the temple. Interesting, cool, special, but not worthy of worship. Okay. No, but nobody shall extend this to Mary. Mary was the temple of God, but not God in the temple. Okay, so he actually got it right. <clears throat> Unfortunately, people say, oh, so you're saying Mary's special. Let's just keep going with that thought. Uh, he was also not married to church liturgy. So he uh, viewed it as um, a guide, you know, a help to lead worship. He was willing to accept the customs of the various churches in different geographic regions. Um, anecdotally, he is quoted as saying, when I am in Rome, I fast on a Saturday. When I am in Milan, I do not. Follow the custom of the church where you are. So what do you think, uh, what expression came from that? When in Rome, right? Do as we're Romans. I don't know if that's true. That's kind of interesting. Um, When in Rome, right? So he was not married to church liturgy. He was willing to accept different customs. Why do you suppose that was? There's a point I'm trying to make. What was the earlier point that we were trying to make? gold and why did he have to deal with more of the refugees and the poor because everything was falling apart right the Roman people were not Romans they were Visigoths they were Goths they were all kinds of races now coming in there he had to deal with a changing culture it wasn't the same anymore the armies were different. We'll talk more about this, but he's got to deal with all these things, especially him, because he is in Milan, which remember why Milan was picked as a major city at that time? Because it was on the border with the barbarians. And so now he's seeing different faces, different people, different languages, different customs, and they're all coming in. So he can sit there and say, we only speak Latin. This is the way we've always done it. We are a Roman church. Or... You can start to say, we got to deal with these people. we got to figure out how I'm going to minister to these people. we got to start talking about how I'm going to talk to these people. And he starts l- willingly going in with different liturgies, willingly changing his approach to be able to preach. Remember, his, his theology was sound. He was a good guy. But he was changing his approach for the different cultures and customs he, he was encountering. Contextualizing. Yeah, that's a big word. Contextualizing. <laughs> right? That, that's what he was doing. So he was, he, he was, he could have either hid or embraced his situation. And he chose to embrace it. And he ran with it. He grew where God planted him. Awesome message right there. Okay. Now, here's the thing about Ambrose and why, besides the fact that he's an he's a impressive guy um, and a very uh, a good example, he, more than most, uh, in the church at the time, had to deal with politics. Um, so did John. Um, he was an effective political leader. Uh, his faithfulness and his love for his people endeared him in the hearts of the people, and they would actually end up standing with him. So he was an effective leader. Remember, he was not a governor anymore. He was the bishop. But the way that he led the church made people like him more than the governor. Okay. Um, so he took an active role in the government. Um, he would tend to do what the popes do today. I mean, does anybody really care what the pope thinks about 
how about the current war in Afghanistan? No, but the Pope, for some reason, keeps thinking that it's important for him to voice mm-hmm. his stance. And I'm not exactly sure why, um, but I'm sure there are Catholics that, that care about it. Where does that come from? Well, it comes all the way back to here. Because guess what Ambrose was doing? When something happened, Ambrose felt it was his responsibility to protect the poor and the needy, even if that meant writing to the emperor about a certain topic. And now it's a big deal for him because he's on the front lines and things are collapsing and there's no one to fight for him because where are all the rich uh, royalty, governors, everything else, where are they going? Well, not here. They're leaving. They're all going east. They don't want to deal with the fact that things are falling apart. So he's the only one left who is willing to fight for all these people that are watching their world collapse. Okay? Do you think he also had a bunch of people asking him, well, where do we stand on this? What should we do about it? Maybe kind of forcing him <coughs> um, to get probably not. leadership on it? Oh, okay. Popular government, government by the populace is something very new. Where they were probably interested, there was probably very little need to understand or feel a need to weigh in. The idea that I can have rights to feel like I have, this, I have a voice in my government, <laughs> that's, that's, that's 20th century, quite purely. You say so. Um, all right, unfortunately, he didn't always get it right. This is why bishops should stay with the scriptures. Um, there was at one point a group of overzealous Christians that burned down a, Christ, a Jewish synagogue. Whether they were really Christians or not, they said they were Christians, right? Um, they burned down a Jewish synagogue. Um, the uh, Theodosius, who was actually a decent guy, but you're going to find out he had his flaws, um, was, he commanded them to rebuild the synagogue. You burned it down, you get to rebuild it for him. Athanasius said, that is wrong. Christians should not be building synagogues. Okay. So what did, what did Ambrose just do? in the name of Christianity. He invalidated invalidated his following the laws of the land. He invalidated justice, Mm -hmm. right? They committed a crime. Mm -hmm. And I think the the punishment was fair, right? It was actually quite fair. It was much more, it was the eye for an eye. Mm -hmm. It was, you destroyed it, you build it back up. You don't have to go worship there. You don't have to do anything with it, but you have to build back up what you destroyed improperly. And Ambrose said, no, that's not, just, that shouldn't happen. Christians shouldn't be allowed to do that. Now, he might have, I don't know, but he might have advised a different kind of punishment. But the fact that he was willing to change justice or, or overlook justice in the name of Christianity, that's a very, very bad precedent. Okay? We'll talk more about him. Uh, he was the emperor. Uh, we actually talked about him a little bit last week. It gets really complicated as this part of Roman history, trying to trace through all the names because they change so fast. Um, but we'll talk more about Theodosius in a second. So did that have a political influence if it was against the Greeks? Uh, yes. Um, not Ambrose specifically. Wait till we get to John. So John no. Yeah, it's not setting a good precedent. Um, all right, so we're going to look at a series of stories about Ambrose that are going to help to understand what the guy had to deal with. Um, Justina, um, during the time of Theodosius, not the emperor, uh, Magnus Maximus r- rose to power in, in Britannia. That's Britain. Um, his troops declared him emperor, and he tried to conquer France. The Western emperor uh, at the time was Gratian. Um, Gratian, however, was 12 years old. Um, as this guy's coming in, obviously he's not old. Um, Gratian was killed, sorry, Valentian II was 12, and he wasn't ready to fight against Maximus. So Justina, Valentian's mother, um, requested Ambrose to intervene. So Ambrose met Maximus, uh, managed to save the lives of Justina and Valentian II. Well, that seems like a good thing to do, right? But the fact that the bishop was called on as a diplomat to go negotiate on behalf of the king that's an interesting precedent as well. Um, part one ends happily. Part two, however, um, Justina was an Arian. And so she said she made a request to Ambrose 
This is 385. This is after the Council of Constantinople in which the Nicene Creed was solidified and the Catholic position was declared once again the official position. 385, she comes to Ambrose and says, how about one church? You got, you got 15 churches. Just give me one church for Arian worship. I, I'm going to go there on Easter. I want to go worship. Just give me one church. So Ambrose, however, what do you think Ambrose thought about that idea? Remember who's making it? Who's making the request? The emperor's mother. The emperor's mother. Can I have an Arian church? Ambrose said, <laughs> not on your life. That is unbiblical. I will not sanction any kind of heretical worship in any of the churches that I oversee. Um, yeah, she, she wasn't thrilled with that um, response. <clears throat> so um, she summoned him to come uh, to the palace uh, and appear before him. Now, she was going to exile him. She had no, everybody knew it. She, but she pretended like she just wanted to come to the palace, right? Um, as he comes in, the people are behind him because they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So when you say rule by the people, they didn't have a vote, but they weren't stupid either. They knew what was going on. So they all came and they follow him. He goes in. They all push on the gates to the point where uh, the, the army and the empress start to worry that there's going to be a, a riot. Um, and so she says, okay, um, can, can, Ambrose, can you, can you go back out and, and um, you know, solve that problem? Just, just tell the people to calm down. So he came to be exiled. She turns it around and makes him go back out and calm the people because she was afraid of what might happen. Um, however, that didn't really solve the problem. The entire Easter week, uh, everybody knew what was going on. The city was ready to riot, which is interesting that the city is ready to riot over a bishop. Um, she still had a request. She was still waiting for Ambrose to back down. Um, Ambrose was still under threat. Everybody knew it. Um, he refused. And then they started to riot in defense of Ambrose. And so she again asked him to come and calm down the crowds. But this time he said, well, it's not my problem. I didn't do anything. You're the empress. You take care of it. So um, he didn't get involved. <clears throat> she didn't like that. But she also realized she couldn't keep going, so she removed her request. She didn't, took the threat away from Ambrose, and she let the people calm down. However, she holds grudges. So Ambrose had <laughs> an issue. Okay. So the next year, she manages to get the... Uh, emperor, which is her son, to pass an edict of toleration that would allow Arian worship. Uh, hmm. That puts Ambrose in a tough position once again. Um, he opposes it. He won't give in. But now it's legal, so she decides to uh, sentence him to exile. Okay? This is important, because this is going to be a recurring theme when we get to John. Here's how Ambrose dealt with it. Um, he took his position among his people, uh, disobeyed the emperor's sentence, and um, he wouldn't yield. So he goes into his um, cathedral, and the people actually come and blockade the cathedral around him. So the army comes out, and they, you know, they knew better to, than to kill everybody in the city. So they start to lay siege to the church. Okay, usually you lay siege to cities of enemies. Here the army is actually laying siege around the church. Okay, this is where it gets weird. These are people, they're not soldiers. So what starts to happen after weeks go by and you're in a church and all you have is that stale communion bread that we have, little squares of communion bread, that are tasteless and plastic, and that's all you have to eat. What starts to happen to the people? Discouraged. Discouraged, weakened. Maybe we should just, get something, just give them one church. Let's just give him one church, call it good, right? Ambrose all of a sudden has a dream that this is the place where martyrs died and they were buried here. If I just had a dream. <clears throat> Let's, there are martyrs here, people. I'm sure of it. And so they start digging up, and guess what they find? <laughs> Two perfectly intact skeletons with their heads missing. Must be the martyrs. The only problem is if you look at the archaeology of what happened in that region, is likely that those skeletons are from well before the Christian era, if you look back on it. Now, did they analyze that? Of course not. What did they see? 
Oh my gosh. Beheaded. Ambrose, you're right. They were beheaded right here, most likely for their faith. Oh my gosh, yes. And so what does he do? They get all fired up about it. Um, Justina was skeptical. She knew that this is probably a big joke. Um, but she knew that now the people were never going to give in. They were just going to fight her. So she finally, at that point, decided, all right, Ambrose, you win. Uh, I, I, can't, I, I can't win this war anymore. So she finally gives in. Now, at the same time, um, okay, so Ambrose is back in power. Now we're going to talk about Theodosius a little bit. Theodosius was a general. He came into power in the east. Um, he was actually a Catholic. He grew up under Nicene. He was a friend of Ambrose. Um, now, we talked about Maximus, the guy that was invading, killed Gratian, and Valentian was second, was there. And then they asked Ambrose to come and negotiate for them. Well, uh, Maximus comes back in 387, and this time he actually takes Milan. Uh, Justina leaves. She goes to Theodosius in the east and says, Theodosius, I need your help. These guys are taking over. We can't fight. Theodosius takes his army, destroys Maximus. Now, here's the problem. Does Valentian really have any claim to the throne any longer? No. Theodosius is the one who now is the last emperor of a unified east-west Rome. Okay? That's who Theodosius was. Uh, Theodosius I. He was friendly. Um, so he goes, he meets Ambrose, he decides to go to church, and as was customary at the time, he sat beside the altar. Ambrose came to the emperor and informed him, only clergy are allowed to sit next to the altar. Your place is actually over there with the people. No, at the front of the people, but over there with the people. So he didn't care whether it was Justina, he didn't care whether it was Theodosius. The guy just kind of was single-minded. This is what's right, and this is what I'm going after. And you're, the, you know, Theodosius, uh, your seat's over there. No, no offense, but you're with the people. The priests are the ones that work up here. Um, so what did Theodosius do? He said, you're right. I apologize for my error. And he goes and he takes a seat. And then when he got back to Constantinople, he removed the emperor's seat from beside the altar and put it back in the people. So mm -hmm. Ambrose not only stood up to him, he actually changed the course of worship across the empire. Um, that wasn't his last run-in, though, with Theodosius. Um, unfortunately, and this is important because this really set our stage, Theodosius um, was a little bit of an impetuous kind of guy. Um, there was um, a Roman general named Botheric. He arrested a popular char charioteer due to sexual offenses. So the games hadn't ended in Thessalonica, even though it was still largely Christian. They still had the games where they would, the chariots would run out and they'd throw somebody in there and the lions. Um, unfortunately, uh, people loved to come watch this. It was still a big game in Thessalonica, which was a military colony, if you remember. So that kind of makes sense. Um, Apparently, the charioteer was really popular. Um, and so when he was arrested, I think it was legitimate, a legitimate crime that he committed. Um, when he was arrested, the people rioted, and they killed uh, Botheric, the guy that arrested him, and a bunch of his army. So there was an investigation. Theodosius says, you know what, this investigation is going too slow. He starts to kind of pull some strings, and pretty soon he comes up with an idea of, for justice. Okay? Here's the deal. Pretend like there's a big event going on. Tell them it's games. Make sure that most of the city is actually in the stadium. 5,000 to 15,000 people are in the stadium. They close the doors behind them. In comes in the Roman army, wipes them all out, the entire stadium. Didn't care about age, they didn't care about guilt, they didn't care about anything else. They killed between seven to 15,000 people in one swoop. Well, gosh, that seems like a little bit over the top, don't you think? Um, sort of Ambrose. Uh, when he, Ambrose um, read about it or heard about it, he wrote a letter to the emperor informing of the enormity of the crime. Right? He used better language than Theodosius did. Um, but he directed his condemnation towards the emperor. He said, your offerings, Mr. Emperor, uh, would not be welcome any longer in the church, and you wouldn't be allowed to take communion while the innocent blood of the people lay on his hands. What did he just do to the emperor? He just excommunicated him. Mm -hmm. He just threw the emperor out of the church and said, you will not come back again until we're happy with your repentance. Um, what's interesting is the emperor, kind of like he did with the chair, realized his error. Mm -hmm. um, 
and confessed his wrong, but Ambrose was still adamant. Uh, he compared his crime um, to David and Bathsheba. Um, he advised Theodosius uh, to repent in private and appear at the church in Milan, devoid of any customary signs of royalty, and with tears humbly request the pardon of his sins. That's pretty specific. Um, however, this is interesting, Theodosius did it. For eight months, he uh, repented in his palace. He did not wear robes in front of anyone so that everyone can see it. And then he returned to the church and begged for readmission. Um, Ambrose requested a sign, so the emperor signed an edict that there should be a 30-day wait period following the order of an execution for the sentence to be evaluated. Okay. With his demonstrated repentance, Ambrose restored Theodosius to the church. So what just happened? What precedent is now Ambrose set? The church yeah. Because the only power the church has is, to, is eternal power, right? I can eternally condemn you by not allowing you to take communion. I'm not sure that's the best thing. But the precedent that Ambrose has set by his rule will be hugely significant. I mean, just absolutely significant mm -hmm. from here forward um, in the Catholic Church until... And really, this attitude will be what sets the stage for the Reformation in about 1,300 years. That's interesting. Yeah. Ambrose was a good guy. The precedents he sets, however, just become completely destroyed later on. Okay? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like John the Baptist calling Herod to account. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was nothing wrong with that. The fact that the way that I'm going to draw your repentance is by excommunicating you, that's where it starts to become a problem. Because now he's, Ambrose is now participating in government affairs as if he's an equal. Right? That, I don't think that was his overt purpose, but that's what he effectively did. And now we start to see the Pope, for, not just for, because of Ambrose, but for other reasons, the Pope will now become a political power. Okay, and we'll talk more about that before we finish today. All right, John Christosom. He was born in, in Turkey, 349. His mother was a Christian. Um, his mother actually, weirdly, sent him to be taught under a guy named Libanius. Uh, Libanius was friendly with Julian. Remember Julian the Apostate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the guy that taught Julian. Um, he was actually a really good speaker. Um, in fact, he would take taken over for Libanius as a teacher, but uh, Libanius said... Um, we would have loved him, but uh, the Chris, if, if the Christians had not taken him from us. So Libanius really didn't think the Christians were all that great. But he was impressive. <clears throat> um, he stayed faithful uh, to Scripture. Uh, he stayed with his mother for a while until she died. Then he went to pursue the ascetic lifestyle. Uh, he, he joined the monks in Syria for four years. He lived in solitude for another two years, um, in which he spent the time mainly standing up, refusing sleep, and committing Scripture to memory. Why would that be a problem? He, stood, he took the time, two years, st mainly standing up and refusing sleep. The scripture memory was good. What's the problem with the other two things? Not healthy. Huh? Yeah. That's not the way God made you. Right? That's not the way God made the human body to work. So when, when you go too far... <laughs> you start to realize you've gone too far. Um, he had a problem. So he finally comes back to Antioch and he realizes this isn't, I, I, can't, I can't live this way. Um, <clears throat> so he goes back to Antioch. At that point, he's ordained as a deacon in 381, year of the Council of Constantinople. And then he becomes a priest in 386 in Antioch. Um, during that time, he starts to preach um, in the Greek speaking church. Um, He's such a good preacher that they actually give him the nickname Christostom, which means golden mouth. Okay, so that's where we get John Christostom. Otherwise, he'd be John of Antioch, mm -hmm. like Ambrose Milan, which sounds more like a clothing line. This would be John of Antioch. Um, let me put it this way. This is the way that the guy was, because he was full of conviction. He's a pretty cool guy. Um, in 387, the city of Antioch repelled against Theodosius because of unfair taxation. Um, the emperor ignored them, and so they had a riot, and they defaced and destroyed statues of Theodosius and his family. This was an act of treason. Okay, So what do you do as uh, head of the church after something like this? Well, you use the occasion to start preaching for repentance. That would be the normal thing, right? 
So he, he um, so there's communication going back. How do we punish the people? Those 800 miles, remember there's no internet or anything else. So they're having to go back, sending letters 800 miles away by foot, no, probably by horse. Um, so while the governors communicated, um, the people began to fear. They realized what they had done to the emperor. And they knew they knew what happened, remember, in Thessalonica. So you can kind of imagine what the emperor might do to them. Um, so he starts preaching a series of messages, um, imploring the city to look upon the error of their ways and repent. Um, it actually starts to work. They start. He starts using the fear that they had of the emperor to start gaining a fear of the Lord. And kind of like Nineveh, he starts repenting. The city starts to repent. And he starts bringing pagans to repentance. People are coming in, and they're actually coming to faith because of what he's preaching. Uh, word came from Constantinople. The city was going to be demoted in rank and privilege. We're not going to go into that, um, but it's a big deal. And the people were marched in chains without consideration to age or social standing before a tribunal uh, to find out whether they would be how they'd be sentenced. So John uses that occasion to say, this is what judgment is going to be like when you stand before God. Can you see where the guy's coming? He's a fire and brimstone preacher. This guy was the real deal. Okay. Um, a number of monks came. They implored the city for mercy. Eventually, um, Theodosius re realizes the repentance that he's seeing amongst the people. And he actually, um, he gives them mercy. In fact, Theodosius said, if the exercise of justice is the most important duty, the indulgence of mercy is the most exquisite pleasure of a sovereign. So Theodosius is an interesting guy. He realizes the repentance, and so he gives them mercy. Why? Because John's preaching affected so much repentance amongst the city. So this is John's abilities. He's a, good, he's a pretty impressive guy. Um, he was an Antiochian, meaning that he took a very generally literal approach to the scriptures which didn't help him in some ways. Um, he, did, he rejected the allegorical interpretation. He was very practical and understandable, even to the lay people. Okay? What did that make him? Popular. I like this guy. He understands it. He has my cause. I get him. And he's telling me, and he's bringing about repentance, and he's preaching about God I'm in the kingdom, and I believe it. Um, he also, like Ambrose, took up the cause of the poor. Um, and here's a quote in the, from his homily, I mean the commentary on Matthew. Um, however, his overly literal approach to Scripture led him to um, an anti-Semitism. Okay? He wrote a treatise uh, in which he denounces the Jews and the Juda Judaizing Christians. Um, he was very cutting in his words which would be typical for the time, but he was very cutting and said that uh, the Jews were responsible for the death of Christ and said they continue to, re continue to this day to rejoice in his death, um, that their synagogues are like pagan temples, similar to a brothel and filled with debauchery and demons. Why is that a problem? It's a great excuse in the future. If you want Isn't it? To like sometime around 1938... Mm -hmm. It's a great time. What are you saying? Jews are problems? Yeah. Aren't you all Christians? Look what your leader of your Christians says about the Jews. Who are the demons? Right? Hitler used this work to be able to justify the Holocaust. Okay? So both of these guys go off the rails in some ways, using they went beyond what they were called to do, unfortunately. All right, Constantinople, 397. It's the same year that Ambrose died. John's life, um, he, the uh, bishopric in Constantinople um, becomes vacant. Uh, everybody knew that the at-large candidates were corrupt. And this is what's weird. Here's a little bit of providence for you. Uh, sovereign providence. Uh, Eutropius is the advisor to the emperor. The emperor was Arcadius. The guy was a wuss. Um, was it Ahab? It was kind of like that in the Bible. Just he was dominated by everyone that told him something. Um, so you, that was Arcadius Eutropius, who probably wanted a popular preacher because it's Constantinople. We only deserve the best. Let's go get that guy in Antioch. He's supposed to be really impressive. He should be here because we only deserve the best. 
Um, so he ends up leading this cause and brings uh, John to Constantinople. They snuck him out of the city because they were afraid of a riot in Antioch because everybody liked him so much. So they snuck him out of the city uh, at night and brought him to Constantinople and con consecrated him. Weird. Um, now, did Eutropius have any idea what he was getting himself into? Not a clue, but he did it anyways. Um, Arcadius was a pathetic slob. Um, he seemed a nice guy, faithful, but generally a poor leader. He was dominated by his wife and his advisor, Eutropius and Eudo Eudoxia, Eudoxia, whatever her name is. Um, they, didn't, they were totally into wealth. They wanted prosperity. They were not above treachery to be able to ensure their, their civilization. Um, and then there was another guy named Theophilus. So John, as he comes into Constantinople, he's going to make three enemies, specific enemies. The wife of the emperor, the advisor of the emperor, and the bishop of Alexandria, who wanted the position in Constantinople, Theophilus. So this is how John deals with the situation. He ignores it. He comes into Constantinople, and he starts preaching the same kind of um, give up your wealth, pursue the ascetic lifestyle, be faithful, repent, if there's judgment coming, things like that. This isn't the place to do it. Um, he comes into the clergy, and he starts um, making them sell uh, a lot of the expensive stuff that they have. Um, even though they claim to be celibate, a lot of them housed what they called spiritual sisters. Okay, So he made them kick them all out and actually be celibate. Um, they uh, would only preach to the uh, the rich people when the rich people wanted and he made them preach in the evenings after the the normal people were done working in the farms and everything else then they could come to church so he actually changed the, the worship style um, he went to the Roman army and started preaching in different languages and he tried to reach the Goths because most of the Roman army at this point are mercenaries from the barbarians so he's preaching to them in different languages and different styles kind of like Ambrose right this is what he does, is he reaches Constantinople. He was taken against his will from Antioch to Constantinople. Decides, well, this is where I am, so what does he do? Just like Ambrose, I'm going to go blossom where I'm planted. And so he starts to um, preach against the abuse of wealth. Um, he took aim at the pagan amusements. This is interesting. If you ask Christians who is Amos or Obadiah, how many apostles there were or prophets, and they stand mute. But if you ask them about the horses or the drivers, they answer with more solemnity than the sophists and redders. Let me, let me convert this. If you ask them about Amos and Obadiah, they have no idea what you're talking about. But you ask them about Peyton Manning and how the Broncos did on Sunday, and you get all kinds of opinions, right? All, that's basically what he's saying. So there's nothing new under the sun. Um, supposedly in 401, he led a mob to Ephesus to destroy the Temple of Artemis, which is one of the seven wonders of the world. So this guy might be the cause of that destruction. Um, here's what tended to cause him problems. He tended to be a little bit um, temperamental, tended to lack a little bit of prudence. He would have, uh, you know, remember how he attacked the Jews? He wasn't always the wisest in the words that he chose as he went and made his points. And then he was also um, very isolated. He didn't mix with people. So while people liked him and they loved his preaching, he, wouldn't, he wasn't friendly. And so his enemies became more and more his enemies because he never gave them an olive branch to work from. And, and that doesn't mean compromise. It just means that he never really reached out to them to deal with it. And so he just kept, his enemies became more and more staunch in their criticism. So he gets to take on Eudoxia and Theophilus. He's preaching against um, wealth, um, and he's becoming more and more popular. Eudoxia doesn't like it. Um, Theophilus doesn't like it. So um, while he's out of town, uh, Theophilus spends a large sum of money and convinces a bunch of his cronies to trump up charges, calls a council of 30 exclusively Egyptian bishops, remember he's from Alexandria, uh, Egyptian bishops, and they come up with these serious but obviously fake charges against um, John. John returns to the city and decides he's going to ignore them. But Arcadius, um, they condemn him. Arcadius, because of Eudoxia, ratifies the decision. The decision. Everybody knew that there were the problems. Um, 
Remember what Ambrose did when the army came looking for him? Fortifies himself in his church, takes the people around him, everybody's supporting him. John goes, the people come out to support him. So what does John do? Surrenders. You're right. I'm going to give in. And he comes to the emperor. Now, Ambrose said, if this is unjust, I'm going to stand against it. When John said, this is unjust, okay, well, but it's a state issue, so I'm going to go ahead and submit. See the difference? Very big difference between how these two men reacted. Um, he's condemned. They're taking him out um, for exile. And just at that moment, as he's leaving, there's a huge earthquake. And so that freaks him out because everybody's into superstitious superstitions. And so now Eudoxia actually begs him to come back and take his bishop, <laughs> bishopric again, which he does. So he comes back in and says, okay. So what does he start doing? The same thing. So he starts preaching against it. Um, unfortunately, um, he starts actually specifically referring to Eudoxia in his sermons, comparing her to Jezebel or uh, other mm, fairly unpopular figures in the Bible. Um, in fact, one, one of the things he wrote was, Herodias is again furious. Herodias again dances. She once more requires the head of John. Referring to, remember Herodias, who wanted the head of John the Baptist. Um, yeah, that, that that's not an olive branch. Um, that's not that's not going to win you friends. Um, once again, um, so that was four three. This is four oh four. Uh, she figures out a way to condemn John with the, another council. Uh, John stands firm in his cathedral again. Um, finally, the emperor himself. Um, sends a note to Ambrose, uh, sorry, um, sends a note to John saying, you need to, you're exiled. And so John, unlike Ambrose, once again says, okay, that's the state's decision. So he um, sneaks out the back door because the people were in the church. He sneaks out the back door and surrenders to his enemies. It's almost like he's determined to surrender. Um, he was taken to Nicaea where he pressed for a fresh trial. None was granted. He was taken to Q. Cucusus in the mountains of Taurus, um, very remote, very difficult to get to, extremely hot in, the, uh, hot in the summer, extremely cold in the winter, difficult to get supplies, it's right on the border, it's constantly being um, raided and looted. Um, so what does he do there? Do you see one of the themes I'm trying to build for this lesson? He sprouts where he's planted. So he starts doing, the local bishop knows of him, likes him, treats him with respect and kindness. Um, his persecution becomes the equivalent of martyrship. People start really believing him. In fact, they start forgetting his flaws and they start just remembering his strengths. The guy becomes bigger than life. In fact, the Western emperor actually writes to Arcadius and tries to defend him unsuccessfully. Um, he wrote letters across the empire encouraging the faithful and, and writing against different issues like the, destru the destruction of pagan temples in Phoenicia and the extermination of heresy in the island of Cyprus. Nowhere remotely close to where he is, he's still writing letters about popular current events. Uh, pilgr pilgrimages were t undertaken to visit him in exile. The people are going to him after they tried to exile him, away from the people. Um, people were even giving him large sums of money, which he used to support missionaries to the Goths and the Persians. Um, as the emperor was um, criticized, uh, Theophilus was just, uh, th you're a joke. Look what you're doing, right? And so they finally uncover and unmask his, his, uh, his character. Uh, Eudoxia is getting um, criticized. Um, John is probably more fruitful in the three years of exile in the middle of nowhere than he was while he was in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Do you think John sees his exile and kind of the government pressure on him as God leading him in a different direction? And he mm -hmm. just kind of follows, mm -hmm. well, okay, God doesn't want me here, I'm going to mm -hmm. go somewhere else. Yep, absolutely. And we're going to talk about, we're gonna, we'll pull this together in a second. Um, uh, so he continues, obviously, the fact that he's still having an effect on the people is not lost on them. So they actually um, tell him to move even further out. They try to take him somewhere near the Black Sea. Um, he's already in poor health. Uh, they just push him and push him, and they won't let him rest or anything else. So eventually he just stops and says, just let me go to this church. They found a little church in a small little village. He goes in, takes communion, says, glory to God for all things, and then he dies in 407 in this little village. 
Um, 30 years later, they moved his remains back to Constantinople, and then Theodosius II, um, the, the son of Eudoxia, who's exiled him, actually meets his remains and bows in repentance. Um, all right. So we have a few minutes. I really want to go over this because it's going to help you understand. We've already talked about some of this, okay? These are two men who both lived at the same, roughly the same time. They're reveling through what's really a huge monumental change in their society. Um, it's, I would say it's, it's similar to what we lived through in uh, 2001 in, in, in the 9-11, um, but probably more significant, okay? They're looking at a fundamental change in their culture. The Roman Empire is about to end its mm, probably 600, 700, 800 years of existence, and now it's going to be become the Byzantine Empire. You've probably heard of that. The Byzantine Empire, which will last for a lot longer. Um, and then what's going to happen in the West is, is a complete fracturing of Western Europe. And really it's going to uh, become a very uh, agricultural rural area. And the thing is, these guys were living in the midst of it. And we look back and say, oh, yeah, I mean, it took 50 years, and this happened, and then 50 years this happened, and then 100 years later this happened, and it all just seems right there for us, right? But they're in the midst of watching all this stuff change. They're in the midst of watching new people, new places, new issues, new items. Uh, how do I deal with this, right? Kind of like we do. We, I open the paper. Okay, I never open the paper. I read on the Internet, and, and I see all kinds of things, right? And I watch the news, and I see this pundit and that person and this person, and I like that guy. I listen to what he has to say. This person's a moron, but they made a good point, right? And I'm taking all that information, and they're all coming together for me, and I'm, I'm trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. That's not unique, guys. What we're dealing with in that situation was exactly what they were dealing in their situation. How do I deal with the fact that we're always under a threat of invasion from a foreign people who don't speak my own language? They're always over there. I can see the torches across the river. I know that they're there, and they could attack at any time. And how do I deal with the fact that the people that are supposed to protect me are all fleeing to the east, leaving no support out here for me in the west? How do I deal, if I'm John, how do I deal with the fact that this is the capital, there's a ton of wealth, and there's more wealth coming in? How do I deal with the fact that the state holds power over me? What is my proper attitude as a Christian, as a bishop, as a protector of the poor, towards the, the government? See the issues that they're starting to face? It wasn't ever an issue before now. The church was never in this position before now. They couldn't look back and say, oh, I see the way that Paul had to deal with this. Paul never had to deal with this. Not this. So they're having to figure out how to deal with a culture that was changing. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it's applicable to us, certainly. But it's also important to understand them and understand the church is to understand the culture in which they live. Because as we saw, a lot of the positions that they chose were based on the culture that they were in and the things that they were facing. Why did they take up the cause of the poor? Well, because that was the issue of the day. They had to deal with this, especially if you're Ambrose. How do I deal with refugees coming, Roman citizens fleeing under the attack of the Visigoths? Because now all of a sudden these barbarian tribes that were just little one-offs that the Romans could easily repel, well, they're starting to ally themselves, ally themselves together. And now instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it's one. And they're starting to invade. And they're getting a lot better at what they do. And the Roman army is no longer Roman. It's really weird. There were all, uh, at one point, the Roman Empire was three quarters slaves. And those slaves were given freedom. Well, these slaves aren't Romans. And so now you have somewhat what we had in the US is a melting pot of a lot of different things. Okay. Um, I'm trying to take out some highlights. Um, the big deal right now is. Uh, that there's a huge fracturing between the Western Latin side and the Greek-speaking Eastern side. Um, so let me just kind of walk you through one of the things that was weird. Um, Theodosius I, that was the last truly unified emperor, uh, dies in 395. Uh, the Visigoths, led by a guy named Alaric, he attacks the region of Thrace, that's just north of um, Greece, northeast of Greece. Um, he's about to defeat them. Still, this guy named Stilicho. Um, he's about to defeat them. 
they make peace, and the Western army is said, you're about to destroy the stop. Just, just stop. Go home. But we could destroy these guys. They're a huge threat. Yeah, we made peace with them, so just go home. Yeah, but you're the east. We're the west. We could destroy them because we're the, where's the biggest threat from the Visigoths? Not the east. The west. So they're, now they have to decide, do I keep going? Well, they decide to pull back, and guess what happens to Alaric? Well, he starts to move west. And so now they're fighting him again in 397. Um, 401, he's back um, around Milan. This time he actually takes, um, lays siege to Milan. Uh, Stilicho comes in and defeats him again. Um, finally, they make peace with him in 403, and guess where they're settling? Right in the middle of what we would call Macedonia, just north of Greece. Well, where does that put him? That's right in the middle of what would always be called the Roman Empire. Right in the middle of the Roman Empire is where the Visigoths are now starting to settle, creating an east and a west, right? Um, which also totally tells people what's happening in the Roman Empire. Did that happen in a year? No. That happens over decades, and people are starting to realize, oh, wait, though, that's not Roman Empire anymore, that's Alaric. They speak this language, they do something different, right? Um, in the process of this, Roman soldiers are pulled out of Britannia. They're pulled out of England, so basically the, the western side of the empire is just shrinking, right? Just moving back. They're just ceding territory at this point. Before they were at least fighting for it, now they're just ceding territory and just falling back. So they're leaving uh, Britannia to the Scots uh, and the Picts um, and others. Um, meanwhile, uh, the Vandals, um, the Swithy, uh, the Alans, they attack in France, and they don't get any resistance because there's no more Roman presence. So they just keep going all the way through, and they actually get all the way into Spain. That's how far south they went. Okay, so now they've taken that whole portion, Britain, Spain, uh, most of Gaul is now just ceded to the barbarians at this point. Um, and they would actually stay there for quite a while. Um, they actually tried to take in northern Italy. But the Roman, gov the, the Roman general Stilicho, he comes back and he pushes them out. Guess where he got his troops? Visigoths. The guy that he just defeated, became his troops became the Roman troops that pushed out the Vandals. Do you see why things are now going in a circle? Okay, so the Romans are now using their enemies as their allies to be able to go fight somebody else. Um, but that also puts the, the n n there's no more Roman ar army. It's a hired army, okay? Um, Alaric realizes that this isn't really the best decision. Um, the Roman soldiers, the actual Roman soldiers do a massacre of the barbarian families. So Alaric decides, you know what, if you're not going to be friendly, neither am I. And so he actually comes in, he marches in on Italy. Um, Stilicho, was, um, who was the last successful Roman general, was um, beheaded and executed because of a perceived rebellion. So there's no one left. The Visigoths march through Italy, um, and they sack Rome in 410. They actually continue on into Spain. They push out the Vandals into northern Africa. And the Visigothic kingdom dominates Spain throughout the 5th and the, to the 7th centuries. Then what happens? The Muslims start pushing them out. Okay, so these are all the things that are happening at this time. This is when Ambrose and John Christos, and that's when they lived. That's what they're watching. They're watching things like this happen in 410, the fall of Rome. Even though it's not the capital, man, that was just resounding across the Roman Empire that that city has fallen to the Visigoths. Okay, um, with that crumbling and all the troops pulled out. There are no government offices, there are no governors, there are no uh, mayors, there's nothing else. What is left? The church. the church. So why did Ambrose feel he had to stand up, he had to speak in the church of Paris, take the cause of the poor? Why did he have to do that? No one else there. Nobody else was there. Or it was fading. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make that Ambrose was right in what he did? Not necessarily. Was it necessary? Probably. But where we go wrong is saying, well, because Ambrose did it, it must be right. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. John, here's John's world. He's in the seat of power, okay? And if you're, seeing the pa if you're in the seat of power, what do you see all the time? The emperor, the senate. 
you see the people, you see the armies, you're constantly in the middle of things, you see the power. So he held, um, he always saw it, he was always close by, and being in Constantinople, he was always the guy that was looked to, okay? And then, and they were always watched over. Why? Because they knew that the church had power. We saw that with Ambrose. Ambrose has power because he's the only one left. Constantinople has power because they can tell the people and they can excommunicate. So what is the reaction? Well, out here, Ambrose is left to himself, so nobody pushes back on him. In the east, what happens? Well, what does the state do? I'm going to make sure that your power is fenced in, right? So I'm going to constantly make sure that the state is involved in church affairs. You are not going to be making decisions without my, without my input. And so they're constantly in there. They're putting their own bishops in. They're constantly making sure that there's, there's a power struggle in the church, in the East, along with the state. Okay? So while Ambrose is allowed, because there's nobody else, to grow, John is constantly under pressure. So then when Ambrose goes, and then the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy, well, what happens when the Pope becomes actually a little real political power? And because they're there first, what happens when the kings start to raise again in the West? Well, who are they dealing with? I'm going to deal with the Pope. I'm going to deal with the church. The church is now my equal. The church can excommunicate me. What's happening over here? You will not be excommunicating us because we are going to make sure that you are the one under our thumb. Okay? Neither position is correct. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. Okay? What happens in the West is beautiful at first, and then it, it goes off the deep end. What happens in the East is depressing to start with, and it continues to be depressing. Okay? So that's just what happens. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, um, sometimes sad story. Uh, there'll be some heroes, and there are going to be some kind of cool things, and there's going to be some depressing uh, uh, and difficult things. Okay? But what you're seeing is starting to set the stage for the Reformation. And you're seeing the origin of a lot of these kind of positions and why they had to happen, okay? They just didn't fall into place. They were there for a reason. They happened for a reason. It just, it had to happen that way in a lot of ways, okay? The fact that it goes off the deep end doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do. And the fact that it was useful doesn't mean it was the right thing to do. We have to evaluate these things and think critically.